I am here today to talk to you about a concurrency algorithm first thing in the morning. Yay. Um, <laughs> and hopefully not put you to sleep. And this is the first technical talk I've done in ages, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so hi, my name is Aral, and I am an experienced designer. So you might know this term as user experience designer, but I personally find the term user to be redundant in this context. If you think about how much of our days are spent interacting with things as opposed to interacting with people. Uh, we are continuously users to the point where the term becomes redundant. So that's why I call it experience design. And that means basically that I design things for people. And I also make things, again, for people. Um, and this is all part of experience design. The two are not separate. The two are combined. Um, if you do see design and development as separate, if you do have these silos of design and development, that's when you get things like this. So Samsung gave me a phone uh, recently, and I turned it on. That's the first thing I saw. It said, error, no SIM card or phone is turned off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Golf claps are in order there. How does something like that happen? <laughs> it's actually very, very easy for something like this to happen. If we are features led, if we think about features, if we worry about our own problems when, we're, when we start out on a project, like if you start out on a project and your first thought is, what's my database schema going to look like? You're doing it wrong. You should be thinking about the user experience, about the people who are going to be using what you make. That's why we do what we do. The hows are very important, how we do what we do. That's what my talk is going to be about today. The technical aspects are very, very important. Without those, we don't even reach a base level of functionality that we can build upon, that we can layer delight upon, and we can layer empowerment upon. Um, but this sort of thing is all too common when we separate design and development, and we see it as two different things. So design is not about the ability to draw a straight line. I hear that a lot. I don't know about design. I can't even draw a straight line. Let me break it to you. You don't have to. Um, I, I can draw straight lines, but it took practice. Uh, that's not what makes me a designer. It's not about pixel pushing. It's not about, goodness forbid, I hate this term, making things pretty. Can you prettify this for us? No, I can't. No, that's not design. Design is about the creative and the technical together. And this is really, really important. This is essential in what we do, because we're, we're, we're living in an age where it's not about the features anymore. There was a time when features were really important. I call that the age of features, where every feature enabled something remarkable. It made something that was impossible possible. When there was a processor speed boost, it meant that we could do things that we couldn't previously do. Today, we're almost spoiled for the amount of hardware, the amount of memory, the amount of uh, CPU power that we have. The limitation is no longer these things for most applications. The limitation is our imaginations and our ability to communicate. That's the real bottleneck. That's what we should be concentrating on. And I just want to say, I want to especially, especially at this point, call out um, the folks at Mozilla and Ubuntu on this. And you might be thinking, what the hell? What's he doing? Uh, this is an open source conference, darn it. There are lots of open source people here. I want to especially call out Mozilla and Ubuntu because you guys are doing it wrong. You guys are doing it wrong. You are features led. You are thinking about features. You are thinking about your own needs. And I'm calling you out on it. Why are you not calling out Samsung? Why aren't you calling out Microsoft? Why aren't you calling out Apple? Why aren't you calling out HTC? Because to be perfectly honest, I really don't care whether they succeed or not. But I really do care that Mozilla succeeds, and I really do care that uh, Canonical uh, succeeds with Ubuntu, because really, our future experiences depend on having an open ecosystem that can compete in the consumer space. 
And that requires a revolution in open source. Open source has to embrace design-led development. Open source has to embrace this if it's going to have a foothold in the consumer space. Open source is amazing at certain things. At whenever we try to scratch our own itches, open source succeeds beautifully. But that's not the case in the consumer space. And unless we're driven by design, we're not going to get there. And I don't want my future to be a decision between do I give all of my personal information and data to Facebook or to Twitter or to Microsoft or to Apple. I don't want to live in these silos. So I need to see open source succeed in the consumer space. And that's why, guys, there is a problem. And that's a problem that we really need to address, because I really believe our future depends on it. So design and development, not two different things. That's why you have a designer here who's going to talk to you about a concurrency algorithm this morning. Design and development are facets of the same thing. Design leads development. Development informs design. Of course, we have testing in there. And we do this every two weeks. We call it agile, right? We call it lean. We call it whatever the buzzword of the year is. We do it every two years. Then we call it waterfall. But the thing missing here is a design vision. All of this comes out of the design vision. The design, the initial design, comes out of the design vision. The testing, when we test stuff, we, we have to filter that through our design vision. Development, we test, and on and on every two weeks, right? So that's what I'm doing right now with my app, which is why I'm here, because the concurrency algorithm is part of my app. And my app is somewhere between Twitter and blogging. It's, a, it's an app for quickly curating and sharing stuff. And it's a continuous client, which means that you can pick up the experience on one device, continue it on another device, continue it on another device, and you shouldn't have to care. The experience should be continuous. And it does revolve around, basically, at its essence, working on a document. Lots of people working on the same document, um, quite possibly at the same time. So of course, then we run into this problem. So there's Yan, there's Laura, Seb and Jenny. They're all working on the same document. And we run into this problem. What happens when Yan and Laura update the document at the same time? We have a conflict right? in traditional systems. We have a conflict. What's one way of solving this? Well, we can say, we're not going to solve this. You guys decide. So we ask Yan and we ask Laura, you know, what should you do? They use some means of communication outside of the system. Maybe they give each other a call. Maybe they IM, et cetera. They decide on something. And then Laura says, OK, I'll update it based on what we decided on. So, and we update the document. This doesn't work that well. This isn't an awesome way of working, right? Ideally, there shouldn't be this whole extra uh, communication that goes on. Another way, way that we can support this traditionally is by locking. So Laura might lock the document and then uh, unlock it when she's done. And we all know that that doesn't work. That's how like, source control systems used to work like 20 years ago or something, maybe even 10 years ago. Um, what we really want is, and Seb and Jenny are like, what the fuck? Um, so what we really want, um, when Yan and Laura update the document at the same time, we want some magic to happen, and we want it to be OK. OK? That's basically what we want. So this talk is about that magic. How do we do it? So let's just take a look, initially, of um, what happens if we don't have the magic. OK? So Laura, and this, that's a time axis, by the way. So, so Laura and Yan are working from the same document state. Let's just say it has three characters, A, B, C, in it. And Yan says, I want to insert an X between the A and the B. And so we create an operation, insert uh, X in the second position. The first position is before the A. The second position is after. And so we get AXB. That's great. That's on his local system, right? So Laura, on her local system, maybe she's offline, maybe it's happening at the same time, says, I want to delete the A. So we create an operation, delete the character at the first position, and that gives us BC. So what happens when Laura comes online, or if this is happening at the same time, in real time, and Yan's insert operation propagates to Laura's machine? So it, it receives the insert operation. Well, if we're naive about it, we just insert the X at position 2. 
position two is after the B in Laura's document, right? Laura's delete one comes over here and that deletes the first. But you see that we have a problem down here. The two do not match. They don't converge. So we violated convergence. The other problem is that Yan wanted to put an X between the A and the B. But if you look at Laura's result, the X is between the B and the C. So we've violated his intention. So we haven't preserved the intention of that initial operation as well. So we can't just naively do this. What's um, one step better than this? Well, we could say, OK, um, we could put some sort of a order to this, maybe a clock. That could be a vector clock, etc. Here I've just got a regular clock, which is a vector. So it is kind of a vector clock, but not the same type. Um, so we could just put some sort of order so that when Yan's insert arrives, we take the full order, right, and we just simply linearize them. And we get BC first because the delete happens first because it was earlier in the order, and then we get BXC. When the delete arrives, the same thing happens. We order them, and we run them in the same order, right, and we get BXC, which is a little better because now at least we've converged on the same result. So we have convergence. They both have the same result. But we have a problem, the intention preservation. We violated that because, again, Yan's intention was for the X to be before the B and after the A, and the X is between the B and the uh, B and the C. So we violated that. Um, and that is uh, intention preservation that we violated. So how, how can we handle this um, with, with operational transformations? With operational transformations, when the insert arrives at Laura's computer, we don't just, uh, we don't just integrate that directly. We transform it in relation to the previous operation that Laura has done. So we transform the insert in relation to the delete. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look. So these are the three letters. We've got Laura's delete operation over here, and the insert has come in pointing at the second position over here. So what happens when the delete actually occurs? Well, that insert operation still uh, points at the second position, but the second position has now changed. So what we, what we do when we're transforming it is we check. We say, is the position of the x2, like in the insert, is the position of the insert larger than the position of the delete? If it is, we know that that previous operation has affected the layout of our, of our string there. And so we subtract 1 from the position of the insert to make it uh, insert the character in the right place. So that's the transformation part of operational transformations. So here, we, after the transformation, the operation becomes insert 1x, and that's what gives us xbc. So when the delete arrives, we do the same thing, but this time we transform the delete in relation to the insert. So there, we see that because the delete's position is smaller than the insert's position, it will not have an effect on it. So we don't, the transformed version is the same as the original version, and we get XBC. And now, not only do they converge at the same result, but we have intention preservation. The X is between the A and the B. The X is inserted in the right place. So this sounds great, so what's wrong with operational transformations then? Well, Joseph Gentle, who um, worked on Google Wave, uh, says, unfortunately, implementing o OT sucks. There's a million algorithms with different trade-offs, mostly trapped in academic papers. The algorithms are really hard and time-consuming to implement correctly. He goes on to say, I'm an ex-Google Wave engineer. Wave took two years to write, and if we rewrote it today, it would take almost as long to write a second time. So that, in a nutshell, is what's wrong with operational transformations. They're damn hard. They are a mindfuck. This isn't. This was like the simplest case. 
But what happens if you have multiple operations? People go offline separately. They do 50 different things, and then they come back. Right? What happens then? What happens if you have local undo and redo? You want to support multiple local undo and redo, and you want these to seamlessly integrate. So the, as the problem gets more complex, operational transformations gets more complex still. So it's kind of like regular expressions. When you use them, you have two problems. Um, so Joseph has actually created a very simple library that you can use called ShareJS. It's at sharejs.org. Um, that's worth looking into. As uh, I would also recommend that you check out his GitHub, because he's got some C libraries, et cetera, that he's working on. Um, and there are, of course, commercial solutions that you can use, like Symperium. This was one of the ones that I evaluated while I was working on my app. Um, it wasn't robust enough for what I needed, hence why I had to dive into the academic papers that Joseph was talking about, and which led me eventually to Woot. Um, but those academic papers, the most cited is currently operational transformations in real-time group editors. This dates from like the 90s or something. Um, which seems like a long time ago now. Uh, and one of the main actors in this field is uh, Dr. Swan, who um, has this really good talk. If you go to the link is, that's just my URL shortener, the link is forward slash swan or sun, um, you will uh, find a, a talk that he gave on operational transformations at the Google campus, which is a good introduction to this. But you also see how academic it is in character. So. What is another way of doing this magic? The other way, another way, is Woot. Of course, there are many other ways. I mean, a diff is one way of handling this, right? So it's called Woot, which stands for without operational transformations. Um, so how does it work with Woot? Well, we start off with the same document structure again. And Yan wants to put an X between A and B. Um, but instead of saying insert X at the second position, we don't do that. What we do is, if Yan wants to put an X between the A and the B, we actually say, insert the X between the A and the B. This is really, really important. Um, in Woot, operations contain their own partial order. So we're not talking about a total order, and we're not talking about vector clocks, etc., which don't scale very well to implement that total order. We're talking about a partial order. Um, and that results in the x uh, being inserted into the string. So when Laura wants to delete an a, similarly, we say delete the a. How do we do that? Via an id. So each character in this case has an id. And the id um, has, is a pair. It has a site id, which is unique to the device or the client that you're Actually, that Laura is working from. So you could use the MAC address and some combination of other unique identifiers to create a unique site ID. And a local clock. The local clock just starts at zero, and every operation increments that local clock by one. And that gives each of these operations and each of the characters, actually, um, a unique ID, a unique identifier. In this case, the A has a unique identifier. Hence, we can say we can ref refer to it as delete A. Um, so that gives us BC. Now, here's the interesting bit. When the insert operation arrives, because it has partial order, we don't have to transform it based on the previous transformations. If it meets the prerequisites, which is that A exists and B exists, then we can integrate it directly. And this is how it works. So we've got BC here. And you might be saying, but we're supposed to insert X between A and B. And A has been deleted. How is that going to work? Well. This brings me to the second unique aspect of Woot, which is that we never delete anything. A is not deleted. It's just been marked invisible. And that makes all the difference. Because that means that we don't have to worry about this shrinking and growing string that we have. It could be a string. It could be a list of rows. It could be anything, any atomic uh, container. Uh, we don't have to worry about that. A is still there. Uh, so we don't delete anything. We mark stuff as invisible. And that means that we know where to insert that x. And so it becomes xbc. When the delete arrives, again, it becomes xbc. And we have both convergence and we have intention preservation, which is awesome. So um, 
to uh, end off just a few words on my implementation of it. So I implemented this in Objective-C initially because my I'm going to have a Mac client and a web client. So um, in the implementation, um, one of the things is, let's say we have B over here. How do we implement what is the data structure for each one of these characters or rows? It's a five tuple. Um, it has an, ident uh, an identifier, which again is the site ID and the local clock. There is a flag, whether it's visible or not, right? Um, there's the content itself, which in this case is the character B. And then it has the previous ID, which is the ID of the previous character. And it has the next ID, which is the ID of the next character. Um, and uh, so you might be wondering what happens, what if we select C? Um, what about its next ID? Well, there is a special character that marks the end. There's a special row that marks the end if you're working with rows. Similarly, for the previous ID for the A, there's a special character. And all of this is really awesome when you want to do undo and redo. So instead of is visible, we can have a visibility degree there. So if it's zero, uh, sorry, if it's one, it's visible. If we delete it, it becomes zero. But what if then Laura wants to undo that? If she wants to undo that, we can just add one to that visibility degree and it comes back to being one. And that's really cool because there might be lots of undos and redos affecting the same character or row, and the visibility degree might be less than zero, it might be more than one, but it all works. Um, and it's a very simple way of doing this. In terms of the implementation, so there's my device and there's a gesture. The gesture results in an insert operation being created. The insert operation is added to an operation pool. The darker operations that you see there have not met their preconditions. So maybe one of the characters doesn't exist, so it can't be integrated. And then we integrate that op operation that arrives. We do that locally as well as on every device that this goes to. So we, do, we integrate locally as well. And that goes into an ordered row stack. <laughs> Has all of the operations, including ones that are hidden over there. Their visibility is set to false. And the operation creates the row, and it's inserted into the stack at the right place. And then we render that. When we render it, we just take those rows out. And that's the visible structure that the user will see. And that is what the user will see inside the application. So that really works well. If you guys want to read more about this, uh, there are academic papers on it. This is the main one. Again, the links are there. I'll have the slides up, and they're online anyway. Um, so there are about four papers that helped me implement this uh, in my application. And it is easy to implement. So in summary, Woot gives you convergence. It gives you intention preservation. And it does that by keeping partial order in the operations and by us never deleting anything. And it is very, very simple to implement. So thank you. And if I may, I did mention a little bit about user experience. If you want to see a whole hour-long talk about it, just go to the link is UX talk, and you'll hear me ramble on forever about it. It's quite a funny talk. And if you enjoyed that talk and this one, you might want to come see me talk about talking, um, which is this meta thing that I'm doing a day of workshops on presenting. Um, and I also teach an iOS development workshop. But the last thing I want to say, the last thing I want to show you is this. Um, this is my dad. And when I was seven, he brought home an IBM XT computer and plunked it in front of me. It was a very old, uh, it was a very new computer. It cost a lot of money, and it had a basic manual with it. And if you remember this, I was seven. Um, I just, I remember how magical this was. My first program was probably print hello, 20, go to 10. And then you, you know what happens, right? It's just like, hello, 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 hello. And you're like, wow, I made it do that. And that was magical. You know, from there, I discovered the graphic screen, stars, Starfield, my first shoot 'em up game, and I was hooked. It was magical, right? I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today if that hadn't happened. If he hadn't put that in front of me and said, go ahead, play with it, you can't break it. I proved him wrong later, but um, that was essential. So we're trying to do the same thing for kids in the UK um, with something called Code Club, where we teach them how to program. Um, and after-school coding clubs. They're volunteer-led. They're completely free to attend. They're completely free for schools. 
and we're in over 700 schools right now. So thousands of kids, hopefully, are getting that same spark of inspiration. Um, and we're going to be expanding internationally as well. So if you'd be interested in helping out with this, we always need more volunteers and more schools. Please talk to me afterwards. And thank you again. Thank you.